I'm okay. I would like to introduce you to Rob Whitman from Houston, Texas. Rob got his master's in biomedical uh, engineering from Tulane University. He came to Houston. He started uh, doing cancer research at MD Anderson using fluorescent technology for various, for various cancers. And he ultimately is focused on um, all cancer using uh, and developing the fluorescent technologies. I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Leave that up there. Thank you. Am I, is the mic on? Awesome. Well, thank you all for having me today. It's, uh, it's good to, to see the science-based and the groups that you guys are doing. So we, uh, we do a lot of different courses throughout the U.S. and, and the worldwide. And um, being able to talk about Krebs cycle is something I'm excited about. Uh, no, I'm kidding. We really will talk about it. Um, no, it's, it's good to be part of the group. Uh, this, is, this is our first time being experienced to the group. I know Dr. Glaros. I went up to his, his office, uh, met his wife, so it's, it's been fun so far. Um, I'll throw the disclaimer out real quick. Sex, drugs, and oral cancer is a fun title. It usually makes people show up here, so they usually put it like first thing in the morning or last thing in the afternoon, but it's, uh, it's not always as fun as the title goes. So... Um, they're all related, and we'll get to it at some point, but um, it's a big topic right now in dentistry, worldwide, whether it's dentistry or medicine, whatever it may be. I'm going to keep getting yelled at if I get behind this podium. Uh, it's hard for me. So first question I'll ask everybody here, what month is Oral Cancer Awareness Month? Besides every month, the politically correct answer. We're going to give you guys a shirt. What month is Oral Cancer Awareness Month? April. Who said it? There's been a tie. All right, we'll do this. You guys said it. We'll give you a shirt as well, but I only have one. So it means you got to come. I got to give it to the ladies first. All right. April is Oral Cancer Awareness Month. Thank you. Not that it's February, and I will give you one as well. Uh, not that it's not that February you don't screen. Not that every month you don't screen. But the fact is that April's coming up. Patients don't have a clue what oral cancer is if we don't ever educate them. Um, I think our biggest eye-opening moment was every time we work with clinicians. So I, I'm not a clinician. I don't practice one. I obviously didn't stay at the Holiday Inn Express last night, so I'm not going to pretend like I am one. But education is the key for, for having your patients understand everything. And if we don't understand what Month Oral Cancer Awareness Month is, or if we don't understand the things that we're about to learn, then that's one of the big key factors that we need to make sure we know. So um, Dr. Galeros introduced me. That's really all about me that's of concern. I grew up with two older sisters, so I'm not used to talking about myself much. Uh, <laughs> so I can sum up my life in like four bullet points, which is interesting. Um, we did a lot of cancer research at, I'm sure everybody here has heard of the largest cancer center in the world. MD Anderson Cancer Center is, is where we did a lot of our research and where we started out. So um, a lot of my research was done in the past with fluorescence technology, utilizing for cervical cancer initially. Um, and then with oral cancer on the rise, we focus with fluorescence technology in the oral cavity. So that's kind of our background, uh, or my background, and where, where the research and the studies came from. I have a master's of biomedical engineering, so um, it's been fun to be able to, to talk science and to learn those things and then taking the things that we learn into the real world and try to create products and services that, that offices like yours can utilize. So. There's some phenomenal technology in the world that just can't get commercialized because of there's a lot of concerns with FDA or whatnot. So uh, we're able to take this technology that we were able to work and convert it into technology that you can use in your office. Um, and we'll go over all that today. But I think my first challenge will be changing the way you look at things. So this was a, this was a quote by Wayne Dyer who, who recently passed away. But this was a quote that for me it stuck a lot because you know, everything's always perception. You have a bad morning. Is the perception of your bad morning worse than somebody else's? So changing the way you look at things always affect the things that you look at. They're going to begin to change. And again, you can look at life for this. You can look at a lot of different aspects. I was at a course one time, and somebody raised their hand this early in the course, which is rare, and said, well, you know, I can, I look at this like my marriage. You know, I wish my husband saw this. Um, you can change the way you look at things, and they begin to change. 
we want to do this for the way you look at, at the tissue and the way you look for different types of diseases. So thinking of different things, instead of red lesion or white lesions or red and white or lumps and bumps, thinking or looking for abnormal tissue in general. And that's hopefully what we hammer home. Um, again, our research in the past at MD Anderson and in the engineering world, they changed the way that you think about things. They challenge you to think of things differently. So this is one of the more famous issues that we have in the world, right? What is this? Everybody's going to yell out half full, even if you're thinking half empty, right? So the optimist says this is a glass half full. The pessimist is never going to even say it, so they're going to say it's stupid to even think about this. The glass is half empty. What does the engineer say? <laughs> Who says it's water? The engineer says the glass is twice as large as it should be. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's an issue that you shouldn't have made the glass that large if that's the only water you have. Or vodka, whoever yelled that out. I'm from New Orleans, so I appreciate the vodka comment. Um, or the way we think about things, the way that, the way, again, that MD Anderson trains people to think about your patients. You know, you have a patient database that comes in here to get treated for cancer. They don't say, oh, you fit these three things and you're in this pool. They look at everything from the patient. They talk to the hygienist, the oncologist, the dentist, and they figure out a game plan for each patient specifically. So they don't look at the glass as a glass. They look at it as something else. And looking at it, they say, you know what? Technically, it's always full. It's just full of something different. It's either full of half air and half, half water. Um, whatever way in theory you want to go with that, my moral of that part is just change the way you think about things. There's always... You know, a lot of times we think about things from 20 years ago or 10 years ago when we went through school. Um, things change. You know, technology changes. Disease states changes. There's a lot of changes that occur. And that's really the message that we try to do and try to portray. So when you're thinking about your patients, this is the way we treat patients. We screen patients when we worked at MD Anderson. Uh, for the past 52 straight years, MD Anderson was either the number one or number two cancer hospital in the United States of America. Um, which is crazy to think that you can have that award continuously. That's because of the cancer care they provide, it's because of the success rates they provide, and the technology that they're able to advance there. So um, they're so well known, and again, this is where a lot of this research and technology comes from, that every time you fly into Hobby Airport, um, Dr. Glaros, you're probably flying to Bush because it's closer to you, right? Every time you fly into Hobby Airport in Houston, and now there's billboards actually up by you guys, that this is, this is MD Anderson's theory. One goal, end cancer. They don't say, you know, we want to end one cancer, this cancer. That's their goal. That's the mission statement for MD Anderson. And when you walk into a hobby airport, there is a huge billboard that just says one goal, end cancer. And it's amazing that they don't even have to write, you know, MD Anderson Cancer Center. I mean, I'm sure it's up there, but everybody knows that slogan. Um, and that's our goal as well. But again, they're a research facility. They do see patients, but it's tertiary patients. It's after they've already been affected. We're, we're a company that has technologies, but when you guys are in the clinic every single day, you're the ones that actually have this ability. We don't see patients. MD Anderson only sees certain types of patients. So taking that out, that you, you are the ones that are on the front line. So figuring out each patient that may not fit the risk factor, the demographic, or utilizing a technology that you can, that's how we can hopefully change these trends. Um, so we'll kind of go over some of these. I have a video that I didn't hook up. So we'll sh I'll send a video out if you guys want to watch it. But um, well, I'll talk about cancer first. This is a this is a word that nobody wants to talk about, right? I couldn't tell you how many times I've heard the story of, well, you know, I'd rather not know, or I, I don't want to talk to my patient about the C word. Unfortunately, the C word is getting worse and worse. It's growing so drastically right now that it is becoming common talk. I mean, everybody has a friend or family member that's been affected. Um, and it's, it's not obviously the best case to say the C word, but hopefully we can talk about cancer like you talk about different types of diseases where, hey, it's great. You know, we have an early stage. We can go in there and treat this patient and have a much better success rate. But seeing the number of cancers rise are, are startling numbers. If you look at the average American family, this is my family growing up. I mentioned many times that I had two older sisters and my dad and I and then my mom. So the average American family is five people. Of a, of a five-person family, one out of every two men and one out of every three women will be diagnosed with some type of cancer. Now, again, this isn't oral cancer only. This is some type of cancer of all cancers. Um, 
that's pretty startling when you think, when I'm thinking of, you know, my father or I will be diagnosed at some point, or now I have a, a six-month-old son. So now to think he or I, numbers-wise, we all get caught up in numbers and thinking percentages, and, and engineers are the worst part about this. I mean, we'll give you a number or a metric for everything. But if you think of it in people, you know, that's the scary part. One out of every two men and one out of every three women will be infected at some time in their lifetime with some type of cancer. Now the famous question is, how early is it, and how can we remove it? That's the biggest goal. So finding it at its early stages is, is always the goal. Right now, worldwide, um, cancer is the leading cause of death in the world. It surpassed cardiovascular disease and heart disease. Now, the great news is about the United States, right now we have not hit that threshold as the number one cause of death being cancer in the United States. Um, so that's the good news about how great our, our health care system is. But the bad news is, by 2030, we're projecting cancer in the United States to grow so drastically that it's going to be the number one cause of death in the United States. Um, believe it or not, that's not far from here, 2030, which is actually scary. So by 2030, we're projecting here in the United States that cancer is going to pretty much double from where it is today, and we're going to see it become the number one cause of death. So th those are the startling things. Those are the scary facts. Uh, the good news is, just because you're diagnosed with cancer, it doesn't mean it's a death sentence. You know, a lot of times people say, well, I was diagnosed, and, you know, and the question for some people is, well, how long do you have? Or, that's not the case all the time. Uh, with the world we live in, with the treatment plans that we have, with the early discovery options that we have, a cancer sentence isn't a death sentence. And that's the great thing about society today. So the good news is we're seeing a huge increase in survival rates. So if you look at some of these survival rates, the prostate cancer, Back in the mid-70s, prostate cancer was about a 70% survival rate, meaning if you're diagnosed today, five-year survival, so five years and a day from now, you're still going to be around 70% of those patients. Right now, because of PSA tests were, came out and they were so advanced, we have a 100% success rate for prostate cancer. I'm an engineer by trade. I don't believe anything can be 100%. Just statistically, I don't know how that's possible. 99.99 I'm fine with, but... Um, the fact is that it's grown that drastically is great because PSA tests came out, and yes, it's a little easier. You can re remove a prostate and, and deal with it differently than other parts of the body, but the fact that we're seeing trends increase in survival rates mean if you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, hey, you're going to be okay as long as we caught it earlier, and that's the goal. Um, the bad news is there's one cancer that's not up here, right? Oral cancer is the only cancer in the past three decades that has not changed its survival rate. What does that mean? That means if you're diagnosed today, it is the exact same rate than when Ulysses S. Grant was diagnosed and he died shortly thereafter from oral cancer. It's because the technology has been the same for the most part. We don't have a PSA test for the mouth. Uh, we don't have a biomarker test like they have for cervical cancer or breast cancer, things of that nature. And all these things are going to come out in the future, and we'd love them to be here sooner. But there are technologies that you can utilize to find things earlier. It just needs to be screened in the right population, in which we're seeing a different change in demographics. So um, this graph is startling in itself because if we had the same number of patients diagnosed every year, you know, say there was just 20,000 patients every year diagnosed, well, we knew the same percentage of people are going to be passing away every year. So not that it wouldn't be increasing and we wouldn't be okay with it being the same, but at least it's not increasing um, if the rates were the same. The problem is the rates have changed for oral cancer every single year as well. So the incidence rate for oral cancer is the only cancer that's gone up every single year. So incidence rate is, is a, a simple word for the number of cancers diagnosed. Again, all these numbers are United States numbers. The numbers worldwide are way higher than this. Um, India, for example, 40% of all cancers in India are, are oral cancers. Why you would have, you know, I, I said this at a course one time and somebody came up after and said, you know, there's actually tobacco in toothpaste in some instances in India, which is baffling to me. But, you know, the use of tobacco is much higher there, so it kind of makes sense that you're going to see a much higher incidence. But in the United States, every single year we've seen a number of oral cancers increase. And it's not increasing by five people, ten people. It's increasing by tens of thousands of patients every single year. So this year alone we're projecting oral cancer to be diagnosed in the United States over 45,000 patients. Every year, as an engineer, you wait for this number to stop. I mean, at some point, it's got to stop 
increasing. Um, and that's obviously our goal for, for us to educate enough and for you all to utilize technology enough to say, you know what, maybe if we can catch this earlier, we can remove it and have a much better success rate. But right now, the numbers of oral cancers are increasing. The percentages are staying the same, so you don't have to be a math major to figure this out. That means more people are dying every year from oral cancer. Um, the famous quote that you'll hear everywhere, one American dies every hour from oral cancer. Take that back to your office. How many hygiene patients do you see a day? I mean, that's, that's how many patients that are passing away. I mean, it's scary when you start thinking about the numbers of, of people that are dying every day and every hour from oral cancer. So um, the question for me I always try to stress is, have you been screened? So many times we go to a course, people, you know, you all are advanced, you're learning, you're going to try to incorporate this stuff back into your office. How many times are you the patient? Rarely, right? So my wife is a nurse, and I always joke with her. She'll tell me every medicine I'm supposed to take if I have a cold, every shot I'm supposed to get, every this. I look at her and say, did you do that for you yet? So I'll urge this to you all. When you go back to your office, make sure you all get screened. Um, you know, whether you're in a risk pool or not, don't do that. I'll do it next time, or, you know, it's just me. I'm healthy. You never know who's at risk. So we always try to stress, make sure everybody's been screened, including yourselves. Um, but even more so, who do you screen? So kind of the, the changing demographics and the reason that the brochures say the way they say. So in, in the middle of each aisle, there's a stack of brochures. If you all want to just pass them down, um, there should be a stack. I think you guys already have some. So the brochures are the same as the title. They say sex, drugs, and oral cancer. It's not because sex sells, or it's kind of because sex sells. Um, but it's because we're seeing a changing demographic in the way oral cancer is perceived. So who do you screen in your office? If you listen to the ADA, the ADA will tell you this is who you're supposed to screen. And it's not that the ADA says things that are bad. It's the fact that it takes time for protocols to change. So most of people have been trained to screen patients that are 40 years of age, smokers, drinkers, and tobacco users, which of course are at higher risk, previous history of cancer. Um, those are risk factors that we know you should be screened for oral cancer. But the scary thing is, if you just screen this demographic, you're missing half the cancers. So right now, with the oral cancer world, 60% of all oral cancers are found in patients that don't smoke, don't drink, don't chew tobacco, and they're under the age of 40. That's scary. So we live in, we live in Texas, and Dr. Glaros will probably attest to this. Tobacco is abundant, if we want to believe it or not. It's happening. So that 26-year-old that says he doesn't chew tobacco, probably is lying. But other than those patients, that 30-year-old that walks in your office that says, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't chew tobacco, for whatever reasons, they don't, they're not, they don't fit this demographic. Right now, those are the patients that are at just as high risk as these patients that do smoke, that do drink, or that are over 40. Um, so what's the, what's the famous cause, right? HPV is the fastest growing oral cancer population. And it's responsible for a five-fold increase under the age of 45. So we're seeing this huge spike in oral cancers, and specifically oral pharyngeal, so back of the throat. And people didn't know why for the longest of times. And now they're understanding why. And now the epidemi epidemiology is going around long enough that it's all correlated to HPV. Um, so it's, you kind of have this one risk, pool, risk factor pool that we're concerned about. And now you have this other one that we didn't even know about that you're also concerned about. Um, unfortunately, what it results in is screening everybody. 17 years of age and older is what the CDC recommends. Realistically, can you screen 13-year-olds? Of course. Um, you're not always screening just for cancer, and we'll get into that. You're screening for any tissue changes. But we have offices screening younger patients. Why? Because whether you believe in Gardasil or not, the one thing the gr these drug companies do phenomenally is the fact that they do market research. And they will tell you that they are seeing sexual activity for kids increase at a much younger age. So... We have the numbers that Gardasil's approved for. Gardasil's approved for nine-year-old boys and girls. People thought Gardasil was a cervical cancer vaccine. It's not. It is an HPV vaccine. So again, whether you believe in the vaccine or not, all that tells us is that we're seeing sexual activity younger, which means we're gonna see lesions in the mouth younger. We're gonna see these HPV lesions a lot younger as well. And that's what we've been seeing throughout the course of, of the past, you know, past few decades. So we're seeing numbers increase. Um, in your brochure, it'll kind of highlight some of these HPV numbers, more likely the men than women. We're seeing 
the number of oral sex partners increase with the number of oral cancers that are increasing. Um, I, was at a, I was at a course in Detroit, and I, I leave it to the dental industry to, to always ask a crazy question. Um, so the, the statistic at the bottom states that six or more oral sexual partners gives you 8.6 times more likely to have oral cancer. So a dentist in the back of the room, because if you're in the back of the room, you'd probably raise your hand and ask this. So no offense if you're in the back of the room. Um, you're, you're a pass. You're doing the course. So he raised his hand and said, Rob, let me ask you a question. Do all six of those people have to be at the same time? So I don't know how to answer that question. Um, Whenever I don't know how to answer the question, I always say that's a great question. And then I usually just skip over it. So I say, that's a great question. And I said, anybody else? Um, so the scary thing is that one of, the, one of the researchers that wrote this article actually came out and said, you know what the scary thing is? We can't even metric how many partners those partners have had. So the numbers are astonishing. The numbers for, for patients that are understanding safe sex. You know, there's this big educational pitch with safe sex these days. They don't talk about oral sex. Um, because, you know, you can't get pregnant from that, supposedly, so kids don't care about it. It's not disposably for they can't get pregnant. But um, So now we have clinicians like yourselves going out to the school saying, hey, look, you know, here's the risk factors that you have for these other types of lifestyles that people have. And we're seeing the numbers increase tremendously in young patients. Um, so, again, there's a ton of different types of HPVs. There's a lot of different things that you can learn about it. HPV is going to be thrown in the media as this, as this terrible thing. Um, HPV is very common. It happens to 75, 80% of us. Most of the time, our body fights it off naturally. We don't even know we've been infected. So patients are going to come in and say, I'd rather get an HPV screening than a rural cancer screening. That's the media talking, unfortunately. But what we do know is that HPV positive oral cancer has been increasing 225% in the past three decades. So these numbers are, are, are crazy if you look at it from the, from the scientific standpoint. The great news about these numbers is we're seeing smoking cessation programs happen, tobacco cessation programs happen, and there's patients that are losing their life very, very young from tobacco. I mean, I'm a huge baseball fan. I played college baseball. Anybody knows Tony Gwynn? He was one of the best left-handed hitters to play the game, and I'm not going to argue he's, he's better than Ted Williams, but he died at 54 years of age because he used tobacco every single day for eight hours a day. So those things are still happening, but the good thing is we're seeing a decline in, in tobacco use. So 50% decrease in HPV negative oral cancers are probably because of tobacco cessation and smoking issues, uh, or in drinking issues as well. But there's this huge 225% increase, and that's from HPV positive oral cancers. So again, it's, it's increasing, whether it fits certain patient demographics or not, the verdict's still out. We don't always understand who's at the highest risk. So screening all the patients are really the biggest concern. Um, 70 percent I mean seven percent of all cancers is genetic so we have our brochure that you all see we had a hygienist walk up to us and said after this course Rob if you open the in the front right flap it has all the risk factors my patients read through these risk factors and say well I don't need to get screened I don't smoke I don't drink you know I've never had sex or oral sex in my life you know they're like well I don't need any of this and then the hygienist asked me said Rob you said genetics play a role right yeah a smaller percentage seven percent so if you have genetics, you're actually at risk as well. So we added that to the brochure because heaven forbid you have that patient that's going to argue everything. So you've covered all bases. Ask your patient if they have genetics and they say no, then I'd love to meet him. Um, he's probably an engineer. Um, so my wife and I always have an argument. Who's a worst clinician? And I like to poll the audience. Engineers or, or who's a worst patient? Excuse me, engineers or clinicians? Engineers is what... So I would disagree, of course, because I'm the engineer. My wife's the clinician. Clinicians are the worst patients in my mind, unless you're talking about like an optical test. If you take me to an optometrist and say one or two, I don't know what you're looking for. Clarity, depth of perception, you gotta explain what you're looking for. But in the dental chair, I believe that you all are your worst patients, but that's probably not an argument I wanna have with everybody in this room. Um, so it's, again, it's, it's in the media, people are hearing about it. Whether you love what Dr. Oz says or not, He's talking about oral cancer and HPV three or four times a year. Why? Because it's better for him to talk about that than something else, I'm sure, and it's a topic that people want to talk about. But it's happening a lot more. There's people talking about a lot more with HPV-related. We all heard the Michael Douglas saga, I'm sure, at this point. Sex gave him cancer. He didn't even know what that meant. He just said it over the, you know, one day, and then his PR publicist went nuts. And he's like, he didn't mean this, and 
So that was a fun three weeks of watching the publicist talk about, you know, well, he didn't mean this, and it wasn't from his wife. And um, so then he swore it was from somebody six years ago. It, you know, it was a whole saga. But he put out there that, that he had oral cancer from HPV. And one of the biggest things that people always talk about is, you know, he's still acting in movies. How does he look so good? And when, you know, some other patients with oral cancer look pretty deformed. The fundamental difference between HPV positive oral cancer and negative oral cancer is the way you treat the patient. So HPV positive oral cancer and negative oral cancer has a different treatment plan at cancer centers like MD Anderson. So the, the only good news about HPV positive oral cancer is the fact that you can actually treat it very easily. So it's not that he had trillions of dollars. It's not that you wouldn't, you'd spend all the money in the world too if you had, if you had cancer. So it's the fact that HPV positive oral cancer is very easy to treat with chemo and radiation uh, as long as it's above the head and neck. So he found a lump in his neck one day, went to his physician, um, you know, started changing the way he talked a little bit, a little raspier, and he was diagnosed with stage four oral cancer. It was HPV related, but it didn't go south of his neck yet. So chemo and radiation, look, it's, I'm not talking about it like it's easy. I mean, he went through the ringer for a while, but he was able to treat that chemo and radiation before it metastasized to the rest of the body. Um, that's the only good thing about HPV positive oral cancer. Um, so again, we want to stress early discovery, finding out ways to go in there and say, look, if we find any cancer earlier, we'll have a much better success rate. But with oral cancer, the hardest thing is, even if you do catch it early enough and this patient is going to live longer, it's a deformity that, that you can't cover up. Um, you all deal with this much more than I do. You can't just remove a tooth and you know, figure it's going to work its way. I mean, you have to work on reconstruction. You have to do different things to help regenerate cells. So in the oral cavity, you use it to eat, talk, everything you want to do, and if you do survive, the, the deformation is, is pretty rough, so the suicide rates are, are increasing dramatically. Um, there's a lot of complications with it if you are one of the lucky percentage to survive. So we talk about survival, but we also talk about lifestyles and surviving with, with a lifestyle that you actually don't mind surviving with. So I show this slide. This is one of our friends. I've met him from, from a lot of different things that we do. He was diagnosed as a 29-year-old cross-country athlete, you know, went, he was in Idaho, went to his dentist every six months. I mean, everybody I feel like says that. I've, I've been a, a month late, so don't shoot me, but um, they keep sending me those email reminders, too, and I feel guilty. Uh, six months, every six months, I think for three years, supposedly he was there in his office in Idaho, and one day he just had a sore in the back of his throat and just, you know, said something's irritating me and finally went to his hygienist, and she's like, you know what, maybe something is back there. I, I can't really tell sent off to a specialist, and he was diagnosed with stage four metastatic oral cancer. Probably the worst you can have. Um, pretty far, pretty, pretty bad treatment, 29 years of age. Wasn't a big drinker, uh, didn't use tobacco. So coming to find out later on, it was HPV related, but at that time, we didn't have like an HPV test until later on when they started doing the treatment. So wasn't a big risk factor. Somebody that walked in your office that you may not think that need to be screened at all. Um, so he's six years past for his, you know, his diagnosis date, and he's been six years clean. One of my biggest pet peeves with the way they metric cancer. If you're diagnosed today, and you die five years and a day from now, you're a success in the books. You know, I, I, my wife may not want to hear this, but I plan on living until I'm like 140. So I plan on haunting her for a long time. Um, five years and a day from now isn't really a success in my books. So they do have 15 year survival rates, but they don't really look at it that much anymore. They look at five-year survival rates. So he's a success in the books. Ask him. They celebrate his five-year birthday. People send you cards. You're officially a success. And it's because you, your odds do get a lot better if you, mass, you pass that five-year date. Uh, but he'll tell you, and I asked him, what's, I went and had coffee with him one day up in Seattle, and where else do you go in Seattle to have coffee? It's when we're sitting in a Starbucks. Um, and I've sat with him and just sitting across the table. I mean, if you ever want to get grounded, Go sit with a patient that's going through something that you could never imagine. And I ask him, what's the worst things that you deal with? Give me, give me your worst days. So there's a few things. One, obviously it's hard to eat. He can't eat. He has so much saliva built up that he can't, or he has so little saliva built up he can't swallow. But then when he does get saliva, when he finally eats, he just drools. He can't control it. He has to eat mostly liquids. Um, and then when he walks every day, it's just, it's a bigger concern because to reconstruct his jaw they actually took out half of his leg. 
So the way they reconstruct is they take out another bone in your body and try to reconstruct your jaw. So half of his leg was removed to reconstruct his jaw. So yes, he shaves in his mouth, which is, which is crazy to think. But um, he shaves in his mouth because the hair cells from his leg were transplanted as well because you wanted as much good cells as you could have. Um, and he said, with all that being said, I, I can walk. He used to be a jiu-jitsu fighter. Uh, so he said, look, I, I can deal with a lot of things. And he said, Rob, look, just want to let you know, I, don't get out of line. He's a Seattle Seahawks fan. I'm a Saints fan. I grew up in New Orleans. They don't really mesh. So he said, regardless of what you say, you know, I used to do jiu-jitsu. I have half a leg and half a mouth, but I can still kick your ass. <laughs> um, but that's probably why he's still around today, because mentally it takes a rough toll. But he said, realistically, the hardest thing every single night that I have to deal with is I go kiss my wife, and I think he's got two kids. They're older boys now. So if they're teenagers, they probably don't want a, good, a kiss goodnight. But he has two boys and his wife. And he said, when I kiss them goodnight at night, I don't feel a thing. I have no sensation in the majority of my lips. See, that's what gets me. Um, he's thought about it many times, not to be around anymore. I mean, it's, his life isn't the easiest. But, you know, looking around your family members, that's why he's around. So when we talk about early discovery, it's not just because you want to survive long term. You want to find it earlier so you don't have to deal with this. You don't have to go through life like this. Um, so every day is a roller coaster for him, depending on medication and treatments and what's flaring up. But these are the things we're trying to alleviate. Is he a success in the books? No doubt. Is he happy to be here? Are we happy he's here? Yes. But living a lifestyle, we'd rather him only have to get cut out part of the tongue or part of his mandible as opposed to an entire treatment. So uh, if you look at the numbers of oral cancer, and again, engineers always take things back to numbers and charts and graphs and pie charts and things. So if you catch oral cancer in early stages, we're going to have a great survival rate. And again, it's a five-year survival rate. Most cancers, if you catch it early, we have a higher, higher than 83%, but I'll take 83 all day long. If, in most cancers, prostate cancer, cervical cancer, we have a 90, 95, almost 100% success rate. But oral cancer is a little lower. And of course, as you cancer metastasizes, as it grows throughout the body, you're going to have a worse and worse of chance for survival. This isn't just oral cancer. This is all cancers. If you look at the numbers, as it metastasizes, as it grows from your mouth to your lymph nodes to the rest of your body, it's going to get worse and worse. We know that. Um, the good thing with most cancers are we're finding it in stage one. We're finding it in precancer, where we have a much better success rate than we do if we find it in stage three or stage four. The problem with oral cancer, all the numbers that we talked about earlier, the reason that the survival rate is not increasing is because we're not finding it early enough. So 63% of all oral cancers are found when it's usually too late, usually when that patient has a less than 50% chance to live. Because by the time you see a red lesion, by the time you see a white lesion or you feel a lump or bump, studies will show you that's usually a secondary tumor that's found. The primary tumor is somewhere else. You just couldn't find it. So the biggest concern with, with the oral cavity is is we're finding these things too late because we're still treating traditionally. When you find a red or white lesion, you don't take a device out. or you, It's already at the point where we need to find out what that is. Um, so we're, finding, we're trying to find things earlier, and that's the biggest thing. So we want to take the survival rate from right now, the majority of oral cancers are less than 50%. It would be great to say we're up to 60 70 80%. But the way to change that is finding things earlier. So, again, it's changing the way you look at things. Um, one of, the, thing, one of the, the things that we always try to take home is the, the definition proactive versus reactive. Most other parts of medicine always look at the proactive approach. I mean, how many times have you gone to a dermatologist, or I speak from our experience, my wife had premalocytic dysplasia on her leg. So that's a potentially malignant lesion, may never become cancer, may become cancer, but every single year I go to the dermatologist, and what do we do? We get three of her ugliest moles cut out. I want five, she wants none, we settle at three closer to me than her. That's the way it usually is. So three is closer to five. Um, I'm not mad that the biopsies come back negative. We're ecstatic. The fact they mail them to me and it takes three weeks sucks because those three weeks aren't the funnest. Um, but it's proactive approach. You know, if you send somebody an ENT, what's the ENT or what's the oral pathology's, you know, slogan in the world? When it out, cut it out. Let's just find out what it is. But so many times in dentistry we hear, though, let's just monitor this lesion. Let's wait to see if it gets worse. And a lot of times that's when it's starting to metastasize and there's things going on that we may not see. So it's changing the approach, the proactive versus reactive approach, and the protocol being able to do that. So if you were in the cervical cancer world like we were in, um, I'll throw a disclaimer out. I'm going to talk about a pap smear. 
not from experience, but from science experience. So I came up to a course one time, and somebody, somebody said, you talked about a pap smear and how easy it is, like it's that easy. I've never had a pap smear. I don't understand how difficult it may be. But scientifically, when the pap smears came out in 1950, cervical cancer was exactly what oral cancer is today. There was 43,000 cases diagnosed every single year of cervical cancer. It's been on the rise for five, six decades in a row. So you're thinking something's got to happen, right? Cervical cancer has been rising. Females are getting cervical cancer without even knowing in its later stages. So in 1950, a test called the pap smear came out. Females have to get it once a year, maybe twice a year now, depending on age, demographic, risk factors. This simple test came out, and again, it's, it's simple in the fact that scientifically, it, it may not always be the easiest test, but when the pap smear came out in 1950, the CDC recommended an annual pap smear for the majority of women. What did it do? It took cervical cancer from 45, 50,000 cases, or 40-something thousand cases, down to almost 10,000 cases a year that we're at today. It's a phenomenal test, right? The pap smear is a statistically a terrible test. It's only 50% accurate. It's the fact that women would go every single year to get your annual pap is what's standard of protocol now. And if you were to find a lesion, the majority of time it was going to be found before it was cancerous. You can remove it and you have no issue. So cervical cancer isn't just decreasing. It's not that, you know, Gardasil is changing the world. It's the fact that the majority of these cervical cancers that are being found aren't cancers yet. They're still HPV. 99% of cervical cancers comes from HPV. So it's found when it's just HPV and you're able to remove that and treat that so it never becomes cancer. Does that make sense? So an annual pap smear, now it's actually advanced a little more than pap smear. It's thin prep, liquid-based cytology, so the accuracy is much higher. But the fact that you were told annually to go get a pap smear, that's why the changes happened so drastically over three or four decades. Um, so all they did was implement a simple protocol, annual pap smears for the majority of women. And that's where we saw a huge change. But with oral cancer, the protocol has been the same for, I mean, it's been the same since since the early 1900s, I mean, again, I, I referenced Ulysses S. Grant died from oral cancer. He was getting screened from the same thing that the patients right now are getting diagnosed with. Typical white light, patients over the age of 40, that's the, that's the protocol that's recommended by the ADA. That really hasn't gotten us too far. The incidence rate's increasing, survival rate's not changing. So maybe we should change the way we look at it, change the protocol. Um, one example I have of this is, it may not be the easiest to see, there are front, you may be able to see it better, but Harvard, uh, was a Stanford, Harvard did a study with the top 25 radiologists in the world, and they put a bunch of CT scans up and said, with your training, you should be able to find an abnormal lesion or nothing in every single one of these lesions that something's going on. So the way that you were trained, they said, hey, find what you would think is an abnormal lesion. And in radiology, you look for big white masses. So 25 of the top radiologists, not one of them found this abnormal lesion in this CT scan. This isn't really an abnormal lesion. It's a gorilla to top right. It's not easy to see. If you see it on an actual CT scan, it's a lot clearer, but it's not the fact there's an actual gorilla in a CT scan, which would be phenomenal. Um, it's the fact that people are trained to look for certain things, and things change. So in CT scans now, you don't look for just big white masses anymore. But these top 25 radiologists, they were trained to look for a big white mass. None of them found this abnormal lesion because they were looking for that big, obvious white mass. A lot of times in dentistry, we look for white, red, red and white, and then lumps and bumps. We may be missing some of these lesions from these patients. So it's changing the way we look at things. Looking at things differently is, is what we're trying to find to do. So um, again, being proactive about it, understanding that there are steps you can take to be proactive. And, and you know, I've walked around the exhibit floor, and most of you all are probably being way more proactive than the majority of clinicians. So, um, probably preaching to preach the choir, but understanding where we can go if we just implement a simple screening technology. And you can look at some of the screening technologies that have been passed in the past four or five decades with cervical cancer, prostate cancer, and even breast cancer. Cervical cancer, pap smears came out, it decreased death rates by 70 to 80 percent. Prostate cancer, PSA test, we decreased almost 20 percent. And breast cancer, by doing mammograms, almost 50% decrease in, in death rates. I mean, that's, that's pretty drastic to see. So hopefully in oral cancer, you can do something as well. So we work with a lot of clinicians, clinicians to talk about a protocol that we always recommend. 
It's a simple acronym, the FACT Oral Health Protocol is what we always try to do for early discovery. Um, hopefully it can help change the trends again. The only way to change the death rates isn't by finding cancer, it's by finding early stage lesions. It's by finding cancer before it becomes cancer. HPV lesions. You know, in the world we live in now, they stop, they stop changing the word precancer, or multiple words. They don't use the word precancer anymore. Because if I'm a patient and I'm diagnosed with precancer, what do I think? I think I'm going to get cancer. That's not the case. So now they're called potentially malignant lesions. You know, I, so now it's PMLs. You know, we figure an acronym for everything in the world. So now it's potentially malignant lesions because it's exactly as it should be. They're potentially malignant. That doesn't mean it's cancer. Not all precancer, not all dysplasia turns into cancer. Not all HPV turns into cancer, but it's potentially malignant. Leukoplakia. You see this all the time in your office. You probably diagnose it clinically. There's a small percentage of leukoplakia that turns into cancer. So that's a potentially malignant lesion. Lichen planus. One of the docs we work with, she's an oral pathologist and also a pediatric dentist, which is pretty rare. Um, she did a lot of research. And she says her biggest scare isn't HPV, it's not, it's not oral cancer, it's lichen planus. Because the majority of clinicians take lichen planus and say, oh yeah, I saw that picture in the textbook, it's lichen planus, you know, it's just, you know, we'll treat it later on if it doesn't, if it gets worse, you know, it is what it is. And there's a, there's a pretty good percent of erosive lichen planus that turns into cancer because it hasn't healed. So it's, it's using those verbiage as potential malignant lesions, you know, cheek bites, it's a small number. But if you chronically grind the tissue in your mouth, you can potentially cause yourself cancer. So cheek bites that people dismiss all the time. Uh, if it's not getting better, our theory is if it's not getting better, we need to do something about it. We hear the story all the time. is that, well, it's not getting any worse. We'll just watch it. If it's not getting better, then we would take the next step. So the fact oral health protocol is what we recommend. And again, catching it early, screening early and often. The CDC recommends 17 years of age and annually for oral cancer screening. Screen whoever you want. Um, I used to think the CDC was, was a high standard until my wife's an ER nurse in the state of Texas. And then, you know, this thing called Ebola popped up. So it was kind of scary to hear the CDC kind of fumble around ER nurses in Texas getting Ebola. Um, but the CDC recommends 17 years of age and annually for oral cancer screening. So that's kind of the youngest demographic that we hear a lot about. And then using the technologies that you have in your office to have the ability to see things much earlier. And that's really the goal. So having, having the ability to see a lesion at its earliest stages being able to diagnose it earlier, that could be the difference in 20% and 80% for these patients. Um, so the protocol, the FACT oral health protocol, again, it's a simple acronym because everybody can remember the word FACT. Um, our clinicians came out. Fluorescence assessment, using fluorescence technology, and I'll go into that here in more detail, it's been able to, to change the way a lot of our clinicians look at these, these patients. So now you're able to see things much earlier, and with that diagnosis, it's not the end game. It's not a, you have the C word, you have X amount of months to live. It's, hey, great news. We found it much earlier than typically you'd find it, so our success rate is 80, 90%. We're going to go through the treatment with you, and we'll be here to help. But, so using fluorescence technology is going to be something to help out, assessing every patient, and then cytology testing where you need be. Um, so again, cytology testing is not something that's novel. It's something that's being used in the majority of industries but using it in the dental industry for intermediary testing, not replacing a biopsy with it, being able to do it for those patients that you're kind of concerned about, but you're not ready to do a biopsy yet, being able to save that biopsy. So um, I'll talk more about fluorescence, but do y'all have any questions until now? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Can you still have the Gardasil vaccine if you've already kissed somebody? So the way the Gardasil, so the question, oh, you're, you're on mic. So the question is, can you get the Gardasil vaccine after you've, after you've already had sexual encounters? It, you know, your body doesn't know what you've been through. It only knows if it's been affected with the virus. So you can still get the Gardasil vaccine until pretty much whatever age, but they recommend it because, to, for younger demographics because it won't work unless it's before you've been infected. So if you're, if you're a 15 year old that's been infected with HPV, it won't work. If you're a 15 year old that has not been infected, the vaccine should work. So it doesn't matter if you have had sexual encounters or not. And the reason that's approved for such young age groups is because they want to do it before people become sexually active. Do you have to open mouth kiss? I mean, does it have to be major saliva? It's, it, I mean, it, of course, it's percentages. So oral sex is the highest way to get HPV in the mouth. Um, 
you can get HPV in the mouth from sharing a drink after somebody. Well, that's what I was wondering. Could you potentially uh, parent give it to a young child? So my mother, I mean my mother, my wife just, we just had our first child. He's six months. And uh, first things that, you know, one of the first things they do before any type of pregnancy is they do a pap. You know, every time you go in, it's not a pap anymore. It's a liquid-based cytology. But they do uh, cytology every time you visit because you can give it from mother to child at birth. So it can be passed from mother to child at birth, sharing a drink after somebody, kissing somebody, sexual activity. I mean, it, HPV is very easy to transmit. So if an 18 year old, your 18 year old daughter, you decide to give her the vaccine and she said, no, dad, I haven't kissed anybody, would you test her first? Because the, the vaccine's no good if she's already been exposed, correct? Right, it, usually the problem with HPV testing right now is, and, and I have a slides on it later, there's no, there's no, I mean, there, there's biomarker testing that's out there that can tell you if some of your cells have been altered with HPV, but there's nothing that, that is there 100% of the time. So, I mean, you could do a biomarker test and find out if, if you've been infected with HPV or not, but it's not 100% there yet. Like the, you know, the, the biomarker test for breast cancer. It's, if you do a biomarker test for breast cancer and you're tested positive for this biomarker that tells you you're 80% likely to get breast cancer, still not 100%. So we don't know all the time. With HPV testing that's out right now in the market, most of the testing is point in time testing, meaning do you have HPV today? So, and we'll go over this after, we have an HPV test as well. It doesn't help if you're infected with HPV tomorrow and you test yourself today. So most offices that we deal with, it's just precautionary. Most people that, all the, you know, all the primary care physicians that do recommend it, recommend it, get it done. I mean, it's, it's kind of, if you test somebody for it and it's 99% they don't have it, it goes back to that 1%, I mean, so a lot, of, a lot of people that do get the vaccine, it's a series of three vaccines, three shots. Um, they just go ahead and do it. So we haven't had to make that decision yet because he's six months old. Um, but that's the hard part. Of it. I mean, with vaccines, you know, there's pros and cons in every which way you look at it. Um, do you know if that vaccine comes single dose or is it always something that's drawn out of the vial, the controversy with potentially? Um, I'm not exactly sure how it's administered. Okay. I do know it's a, a series of three vaccines, three different, three different injections over the six month period of time. And I know it, it hurts, um, but it protects only against a few strands of HPV. Mm -hmm. The good thing is the strands of HPV it protects against are the ones that cause cancer the majority of the time. So cervical cancers caused by HPV 16 and 18, 90% of the time. There's a few other random ones that happen. HPV 16 causes the majority of the oral lesions that we find. Uh, the good thing is about the vaccine, it protects us against four of those, and now it's, I think, six or eight now. It keeps growing. Um, but I'm not sure exactly how it's administered yet. I'm sure it probably varies. But those are questions that, that people get all the time. Um, thanks for asking. So with, with fluorescence technology, I hate saying the word fluorescence for many reasons. The word is not easy to say, and it's hard to spell. So most other industries that utilize fluorescence technology Call it a green light or a blue light technology. Feel free. Uh, Olympus has been utilizing fluorescence technology for upper and lower GI issues. So whenever you go get an upper endoscopy done with an Olympus green light, that's fluorescence technology. They just they market it a lot better than we do because it's the special green light. Um, but fluorescence has been around for, for decades now. It's nothing that's been novel for mucosal cells. It's been around for a long time. In the dermal world, uh, we've been utilizing it for quite some time. Uh, skin cancers, most surgery, things of that nature. You can use it for looking for bacteria. A lot of things fluoresce differently. So yes, Horatio Kane in the CSI Miami, when he you know, puts his little glasses on and shines a light to look for certain things in a hotel room, that's fluorescence technology just used in a different application. So um, I don't recommend going to look around in a restroom with these things because they see a lot of things. Um, all we care about is mucosal cells, right? So you're going to start to see some things differently. And the way the science works, and um, I won't go into too much detail about the science, so feel free to ask me. Um, I think the 10 years we've been doing this, I've had six legitimate science questions. And of the six, I think four of them were like stump, stump the sales guy to try to see if he really knew. Um, I assure you the science is pretty interesting, but um, there's a lot more details to it. So. We've all paid for it. It's been government funded research for a very long time in both the United States and Canada. So if you look at where this has been done, the research, there's a group of clinicians that have been doing this research for a long time at MD Anderson Cancer Center and British Columbia Cancer Center in Vancouver. 
every year we do a home and away. So they'd come here, we'd go there. Uh, Vancouver is a beautiful place to visit, so we would ever go up there. And now you're able to go in there and do um, cancer research, share your stories. But this technology has been utilized for a long time. The way it's utilized at MD Anderson is differently than the way you all will utilize it. They're not necessarily screening for cancer there. The patients are already there for a reason. So they're using it for different follow-up visits. They're using it for recurrence of cancer. They're using it for seeing how large tumors are when they are removing it, so you could see the margins better. Um, so there's a lot of different ways it's used. Uh, it's different in each setting. But the way the science works, and I wasn't lying when I talk about Krebs cycle, we will talk about it. So NADH, FAD, these are things that naturally occur that are used throughout the body for energy. Um, keratin, collagen cross-linked, all these things naturally fluoresce. So as these things have a natural fluorescence property, they're going to fluoresce this bright color back to you. As cancer progresses, what happens? These things are used. Uh, Krebs cycle occurs. My wife can't believe I have this on the slide. Um, as cancer progresses, Krebs cycle occurs. So we use these fluorophores for energy. So if you have less of something that fluoresces, what happens? There's less fluorescence, right? Um, that's one factor. Collagen cross-linked. Collagen is a nice, healthy fluorescence. It fluoresces a bright color back. So you can kind of see some of these fluorescences. This is collagen cross-links under a microscope. This is just fluorophores from your tissue. They fluoresce a nice, healthy color back when shine with a certain wavelength. As collagen cross-links are broken down, which can happen for multiple reasons, cancer being one, trauma being another, so it's not always just a cancer thing. As collagen's broken down, there's less collagen to fluoresce back, so there's less fluorescence. Does that make sense? I don't, I don't do this, so, but I've heard stories. If you ever go to a makeup counter at the makeup store, there's this blue light, and you tell you to look in the mirror and say, look at all your, look at your aging spots you can't see yet. That's exactly what this does. It looks at the collagen st structures, and you can see collagen breakdown before your eyes can see them. So now you're able to see the collagen structures in your face, and they appear darker because it's starting to change the collagen cross links. Something's changing them, whether it's sun damage, um, trauma in the mouth or it's cancer of some nature. So does that make sense? Um, so collagen cross links are one issue. As it's broken down, you see things darker, and I'll show you pictures. It'll make it easier. Um, fluorophores, NADH, FAD, as that changes. And then blood. We know angiogenesis occurs when cancer progresses. So the more blood that there is there, the more blood vessels, blood absorbs this wavelength. So it'll appear darker as well. So there's kind of three factors that happen. Um, I like to bring it back to the real world challenges. There's three clinical things that happen to alter the way the tissue changes. Chemical, mechanical, and thermal damage. Mechanical and thermal, burns and bites. It's gonna change the way this tissue appears to you. So mechanical damage, if you bite your cheek, it's gonna change the blood flow. It's gonna change the collagen cross links. Things are, are changing to help heal that tissue. So it's gonna appear dark. If you have cancer, it's gonna appear dark. So how do you decipher between the two? That's where the standard two-week follow-up process occurs in every office right now with Perio, and that's how it works with this. So in two weeks, if you have a cheek bite, it should have healed. If you have a burn, it should have healed. If it hasn't healed at that point, you still want to take that next step. You're either chronically grinding your cheek, something of that nature. So the great thing about the tissue in the mouth is it, feel, it heals faster than any tissue in the body. So your mouth regenerates every week, per se. So now you have the ability to say, hey, it's a dark lesion, right lateral border, you, you said you're a grinder, just come back in a week, that should be healed, but you need to make sure that you, you know, either wear your night guard or whatever it may be. So there's things that change in your tissue that's not always the C word, but utilizing fluorescence to be able to see those things. Um, and there's a direct correlation to how dark things are to how advanced cancer is. Clinically, it's hard to disseminate but for you all. Um, so if it's a little darker or if it's completely pitch black, it usually is the stages of cancer, but again, that's for tertiary facilities, that's for, that's for MD Anderson, that's for places that are trying to find out where to do biopsies. Uh, for you all, we're looking for dark versus light-based technology to see these changes that, that are there. So if you see a lesion here, healthy tissue is gonna fluoresce this bright green color, green yellow color, whatever color the pigment's gonna show up for each patient. And then abnormal tissue is gonna appear dark. I would love to say it's as easy as that. It's, it's complex, the mouth is complex. The reason cervical cancer is a lot easier is because the cervix is one uniform type of tissue. The mouth, 
isn't that way. You have a lateral border of the tongue that's different than the palate, that's different than everywhere else. So when you look at the mouth, the great thing about it is you can always do your differential diagnosis. So if you see, see a lesion on the right side, do your differential, it's on the left, it's bilateral and regular shaped, probably something with their anatomy. They can have some sort of, um, some sort of lesion, some sort of vasculature that happens on both sides, that's a good thing. But if it happens on one side, if it's unilateral and irregular shaped, that's kind of one area of concern. That's kind of one strike. Have them, two backs in, have them back in two weeks and be able to reassess that lesion. Does that make sense? So the whole point of fluorescence technology is that we want to find this earlier, right? So the earlier you find cancer, the better it is. And this is a cross-section of your epithelial tissue. It looks like it's huge. It's actually the thickness of a human hair. So the cross-section is, is not really to scale, of course, but we do this because the majority of the time cancer is being found, it's later stages when it's already starting to erupt past the epithelial tissue. So right now, if you utilize fluorescence technology in your office and say, hey, well, I'm going to use this when I see a lesion, red, white, to kind of reassess it, you don't need a device at that point. You already saw it visibly, then it's, it's either later stages or, you know, you, you don't need it at that point. So we want to utilize this technology because cancer starts on the basement membrane. You're not able to see past the basement membrane or past the epithelial tissue towards the basement membrane with your eyes, with your loops, with anything. So being able to utilize this, you're able now to see where the cancer starts. This light penetrates way past the basement membrane. So it's able to tell us what's going back. And at that point, our goal is to find this here when we can just cut part of the tissue out, take a laser biopsy, take a laser, ablate the tissue. There's a million protocols that you can put together. But this is an 80 to 90% survival rate. This is a lot worse. So that's the goal, and that's really where fluorescence should be utilized. Does that make sense? That's why we always say fluorescence assessment should be done on every patient. We don't know who's a higher risk factor, who's not. We don't know who has a lesion, who doesn't. If you see the lesion, again, it's usually stage three, stage four. So being able to find these things much earlier is the goal. Um, everybody loves pictures. There's a ton of studies out there. I won't bore you with studies. So if you want to hear the studies and the clinical data, we would love a 20,000 double blind patient study. Nobody has the money. We have the products. We have the technology. Nobody wants to put up the money because to somebody that works at MD Anderson, they told me the story of it's kind of like a parachute. Nobody's ever tested the parachute to see if it works, right? Because what's the test? You test a parachute and you test somebody jumping on a plane without a parachute. So you're not going to do a, a negative test on that. So with fluorescence technology, there's been a bunch of patients that have come in that you're able to see lesions earlier. What are those lesions? This isn't a diagnostic tool. It's a discovery device. We're helping you see these lesions earlier. From that standpoint, we have to figure out what it is. We have to do a two-week follow-up. We have to reassess, do a cytology, do a biopsy at that point. So um, that's kind of where the studies have been. There's a ton of studies. There's a ton of lesions that we've been able to find. But again, it's finding these and using them as a screening tool. Um, there's a few things on the market. Again, I won't even go into all the devices on the market. Um, I'll throw the disclaimer out. I, we did start Ford Science. This is our product. But I'll tell you, if you have a Velscope, you haven't identified, it's all the same technology. Um, just make sure you use it. We hear the story all the time about people have a device, whether it's ours or anybody else's, and they only use it with this, or patients don't always pay for it. Figure out a way to incorporate it for every patient. Because I assure you, when you start screening with it, you're going to see things that you've never seen before. We have a lot of offices that incorporate it into hygiene. Um, do it in hygiene, and then, of course, before you do anything, refer out, have you all take a look or have the dentist take a look. So um, Velscope came out in 2006, 2010. It was the next edition came out. You look through a scope. Um, the Identify came out. Again, these are all the same scientists. We've worked in some form or fashion with every company out here. Um, this is an intraoral device, and then our device came out. So Whatever device you have, look at it. Make sure that you can look at per patient costs. Make sure that you can understand that you're going to screen every patient and be able to clinical photo of these lesions. So this is a smart filter that we have. One of our doctors called us one day and said, you know what would be great? If I can just shine this bright blue light and just take a picture with my iPhone. I'm thinking that's like, of course, you can probably do that right now. He's like, no, I can't. So it's like the bottled water theory. Like whoever thought of bottled water, it's so stupid, it's genius. He called us, and I was like, this is so stupid. This is awesome. So um, 
Dr. Nichols, I told him whenever we talk about it, I have to give him credit. He came up with the iPhone filter for us to be able to take pictures with. So this is whatever technology you're looking for. This is essentially the way it works. You're going to shine a bright blue light on the tissue. You don't want to see blue light. So right now, if you're looking in a patient's mouth, all you're going to see is blue. You put a pair of glasses on, or with a velocoscope, you look through a scope. You put a pair of glasses on, and you don't see any blue. The blue is still going to the tissue. All you want to see is the fluorescence coming back from the tissue. Does that make sense? So, so many times we have clinicians call us up and say, Rob, I have the device on, and I have a pair of glasses on. I don't see anything. It's not working. So I'll tell you to, to shine this in your eyes and then remove the glasses. I won't do that. I want to. Um, the glasses are not protective eyewear. They're not laser glasses. What the glasses do is specially filtered to block out this specific wavelength of light that's been clinically proven to work for cancer. So curing lights don't find cancer. This device doesn't cure. That's pretty much the way it works. Um, if you wear this pair of glasses and use a filter, now you're able to go ahead and see these changes much earlier. So it's a simple system, um, very easy to do. And then when, again, when you see the lesion you're concerned about, take out your iPhone, your smart device, whatever it is, clip on a filter, and now you're able to take a picture for that lesion. So when they're back in two weeks, you have a much better success rate to be able to find the lesion because I'm sure you're going to sleep in two weeks and you're probably going to forget how big the lesion is. Um, does that make sense? So we have, we have offices that do this on mission trips. Um, the, the group that goes to Belize that's here, uh, they took our device to Belize last year and they get to screen people in Belize because there are no consumables with the device and you're able to go ahead and screen everybody. So it's good to be able to see. But again, whatever technology you're utilizing, I think the biggest concern in dentistry is nobody wants to do an oral cancer exam, right? Because you're not, you're not really diagnosing cancer. So, so many times we've heard people change their verbiage from, you're not doing an oral cancer exam. This device doesn't find cancer. It's not a detection device. It's really a complete oral health assessment or an enhanced oral health assessment because your patients don't want to hear that you did a cancer screening. Rob, I did a cancer screening and something's going on. Come back in two weeks. What do you think they think? I got cancer. The worst two weeks of your life. So how about this? How about, Rob, we said a complete oral health assessment, which is what you do anyway. Go down the list of a million things you do, because you probably don't tell your patients all that you do anyway. I'm looking for cancer, precancer, HPV, gingivitis, plaque. I'm doing this com comprehensive assessment. We also have the latest technology that allows us to see some of these changes much earlier. If I find a lesion, maybe trauma, maybe something more severe, we're going to have you back in two weeks to reassess that lesion. That's it. You're not diagnosing cancer. Have that patient back in two weeks. If they're back in two weeks, that lesion's still there, we want to take the next step. Whether it's a cytology, a biopsy, whatever it is, each office is different. Does that make sense? A lot of times we hear the story of, well, I did an oral cancer screening and I found HPV, so that's a false positive. By definition, that is a false positive. By definition, looking for one thing and finding something else is a false positive. For one, I would rather have a false positive than a false negative any day of the week. I'd rather know I don't have cancer than not know I do. But the false positive word is crazy because if you're looking for cancer and find HPV, technically that's a false positive. You're not looking for just cancer. You're looking for anything that's going to change in your tissue. You want to look for any tissue abnormality. You want to look for any potentially malignant lesion. Does that make sense? So if you're looking around the mouth and you find a lichen planus, hey, Rob, great news. We found a lichen planus. We're going to be able to treat this patient. There's a bunch of treatment plans. We can take pictures. We can continue to do this. We're going to remove it. You can do a lot of different things with it. But if you don't know that's lichen planus and you just think it is, who knows what's growing underneath that tissue? Um, so that's the biggest concern is being able to verbalize that to patients. Step one for every complete oral health assessment, complete oral exam, is always a white light exam. This is not replacing the white light exam. Always do the white light. Always pull the tongue out, lumps and bumps, palpations around the neck. It is not a massage. You have to really dig deep. There's tumors that are being found in the neck that at times nobody has a clue about. A lot of patients that are diagnosed right now that are older attorneys, whatever it may be, they'll, because they wear ties every day, it's probably the only reason I said the word attorneys, but older gentlemen that get diagnosed that wear ties every day, it's because one day they just go tie their tie and say, you know what, there's something going on here. That's when they're diagnosed, they self-diagnose themselves. So at that point, you, you still need to find those lesions. So make sure you do your palpations, make sure that we're doing the white light exam. And then it's simple. Turn your overhead exam light off. You don't need to close all the room lights. You don't need to close the blinds. This isn't like a drape thing. Turn the overhead exam light out of the patient's mouth. 
shine a light in the patient's mouth, put a pair of glasses on. That's it. So now you're able to see these changes before they even get to be late stages. So I'll show you some clinical images now and kind of hammer home the point. But if you look at patients on a daily basis, we get calls three, four years after patients have, or after clinicians have this device, say, Rob, this thing isn't working. I've never found a, a lesion. I'm happy to hear those phone calls. I'm happy to hear it doesn't work because that means you didn't find anything. We hope you never find anything. Um, so don't expect to find anything. It's like the pap smears of the world. You expect a normal. 0.5% of pap smears come back abnormal, 0.5. So expect to do a screening on a patient and not see anything. But again, we're still gonna go ahead and do these screenings. Lateral border of the tongue, you see blood vessels here. This is nice, clearly defined blood vessels. You're gonna see patients that are tobacco users that have a thicker keratosis, keratotic lesions, it's gonna hyperfluoresce. So you're gonna start to see things differently. It's gonna be interesting what you see. Um, this isn't the best picture because it's with my phone, but back of the throat, oral pharynx, there's some increased blood vessels here. What do you do when you see on the left? You do it on the right. It looks the same on both sides. That's a good sign. So always do your differentials. The back of the throat, you're going to go back and use this. It's going to be flu season. You're going to freak out. You're going to start seeing inflame. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting. So being able to understand where it is, differential diagnosis is important. Um, Hygienists appreciate this a lot, and you all probably will as well. Bacteria fluoresces red and orange. I'm not going to tell you what type of bacteria because we've never cultured it. That's not what we're here for, but you're going to start to see people's tongues with bacteria all around. You want to sell more, whatever you want to sell more of, toothbrushes, toothpaste, floor, I mean, you can name it. Hand the patient a pair of glasses, shine the light in their mouth and say, I now see your plaque. They will freak out. They will freak out. It's like the disclosing solution, except now you don't have to use the disclosing solution. Um, so we've seen thrush, candida albicans, um, a lot of different lesions. We do a lot of work at an HIV clinic in Houston. So these HIV patients are rarely going to die of HIV these days. They're going to die of something else. And there's, there's bacteria in their mouth that could be life-threatening. We see a lot of thrush and bacteria in the back of their throats. And it's interesting some of the cases that we're able to see. So you're going to see these things. You're going to see these lesions, and they're going to pop up Really, really a bright orange, bright red color, pinkish color. Again, depends on the type of bacteria. Um, attached gingiva, again, there's kind of a basis to be able to see. Attached gingiva has a lot of elastin fibers, and elastin uh, has a lack of fluorescence, so you're going to see these, elast these, I mean, these uh, attached gingiva up here darker. Again, differentials, both sides, uniform, that's normal. We had an office call and say, I want to do a cytology on, you know, on... They're attached gingiva. Do I do it in all of it? That's, that's perfectly normal. We want to do the differentials. So you're going to see things differently. Um, but it's lesions like this that you may or may not see now. They walk in your office, back of the throat, oral pharynx. It looks like a flu season. It looks like an inflammation. It looks like a coffee burn. It looks like a lot of things. The, the, the it looks like of the world, I hate, by the way, because that means you're assuming something. The, it looks like I have no clue is usually what I try to say. So... That it looks like I have no clue what that is. There's only a few ways to find out what it is. Come back in two weeks. If that lesion's healed, probably was a burn, some sort of inflammation, something minor. If that's still there in two weeks, we'll probably want to take the next step. I didn't say, Rob, I just did a cancer screening, and you know what? You got something going on. I said, look, there's something going on in the back of your throat, really not sure what it is. Typically, your mouth heals pretty quickly, um, but I still feel a lot more confident if you come back in two weeks. We'll reassess that lesion and we'll take the next steps there. They'll come back now, because if you said, you know, I did a cancer screening, give them back in two weeks, I bet you, flip a coin, the half of them won't come back, because they, I'd rather not know theory. Um, so lesions like this, back of the throat, oral pharynx, you see some increased blood vessels, but now with this technology, it's a black hole. Not the best picture, because I took it. Um, saturation a little bit, so when you take these pictures, it's a little harder, because it's light versus dark. Flash needs to be turned off. The light actually is too bright. Our light is actually too bright. You have to bring it back a little bit. But there's a huge dark hole right there. A patient comes back two weeks later. Rob, you know what? We reassessed this lesion. It's still there. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the next step. At this clinic, they do a lot of biopsies there. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of the Bering Omega Clinic in Houston. It's the HIV clinic we work with. So Dr. Nichols lectures worldwide on HIV and, and, uh, and oral cancer. So it's, it's a pretty interesting subset that we're able to see but this patient comes back two weeks later they do a biopsy turns out to be dysplastic tissue 
contrary to what people think, this is a terrible conversation to have. This is a great conversation to have. Rob, great news. We found this lesion before ever, it can even advance. We don't know if this is ever going to be a cancer or anything of that nature because only 20 to 14% of cancers become life-threatening. But at this point, we're able to find this lesion, reassess it. We found it. It was dysplasia. We have an 80 to 90% success rate. And at that point, we're able to go ahead and do that part. Um, so these are the lesions we're trying to find. Back of the throat, oral pharynx. This is a pretty red lesion. You could probably see it. This patient had a completely dark spot, a lot more pronounced, a lot easier to see now. And now when the specialist is doing a biopsy, guess what's easier to do? It's easier to do a biopsy, it's easier to do an excisional, whatever that may be. And again, this is not the easiest one to do because of where it's located, but um, this was a carcinoma in situ, so still earlier stages and it didn't metastasize yet. Um, this was a periodontist that we had. It was pretty ugly looking, you can kind of see it all over here, but now the margins extended much larger, again, you're able to see it much larger, much more invasive. Those are the things that we're trying to look for. Invasive squamous cell, what this was. We can all see this tumor. This is pretty bad. I probably want to do something about it. But now we realize that because this was still early enough, but yet not invasive enough, they actually found this tumor was only part of the lesion. It was starting to grow down here, but it was still localized. So it was still dysplasia. It wasn't even cancer yet. But the parts that we biopsy were dysplasia. What was in the other parts? I'm sure there was some, some sort of cancer there. So this patient had to do a pretty radical surgery to go. But uh, we actually diagnosed this with cytology. There was bacteria as well. So there's a lot of different things going on with this lesion. Um, palate area. You look in the palate of this patient, midline. In person, it was a little more red than you can see here. But here, you see a lot more pronounced. So this patient didn't even wait for two weeks. They just said, hey, let's do a biopsy. Turned out to be moderate dysplasia. So again, early stage, potentially malignant, where you have the ability right now, when you cut out anything in the palate, it's not easy. I mean, you all know this is for a living. It's, it's a rough treatment for this patient, but I'd rather do that with a 90% success rate than wait for it metastasize and, and have a much worse success rate. So those are the lesions we're trying to find. This is an HPV lesion that we found. Um, so again, we're not finding cancer, precancer, HPV. You're looking for anything abnormal. And at that point, have them back in two weeks to reassess that lesion. Does that make sense? Um, so this was multifocal epithelial hyperplasia. So this is the type of HPV that we're finding a lot in certain types of uh, pockets and subsets of dentistry. Um, and then the last case that I saw, this case was last week. This is a zoomed in, high resolution image of the tongue. This is a clinician that does phenomenal work. Um, I consider him to be a pretty advanced clinician with this technology. Patient came in and didn't think anything of it, came back, this is an HIV patient, and saw a lesion here on the tongue, and the doc said, look, 99% sure this is nothing. I typically don't even have follow-ups with this. And, and the patient was pretty educated, said, 99%, you're not sure. I said, well, technically, I'm 99% you know, sure. He said, well, look, do you have anything else you can do? I want to be certain. I'd rather do a biopsy right now. I said, well, look, let me take this device out. Typically, I only do this during my pathology days, but I'll do this as well. It was pitch black. And the doctor sat back and said, wow, um, you know what? Let's do this. Let's do a biopsy. Let's find out what this is. So this turned out to be minimally, minimally invasive squamous cell carcinoma, and it's HPV positive. So, I mean, this doc was baffled because he, like a lot of people, took, the, took our device out only when something was visible. So now he realizes, okay, every patient that walks in my door, he said, I, I do this for a living, and I was 99% sure this patient had nothing wrong with him. And now there's this huge black hole that, again, I'm not a clinician here, but I, I can see that. It's not that hard to see. So it's finding things earlier, being able to take the next step. I have a few more clinical images, but um, this was a lesion in the gallery area in Houston. You see some tori, kind of irregular shaped, but now it's completely pitch black. This was a high-end cosmetic office. This, the risk factors probably aren't there for this patient to have cancer. Obviously, they're going through some ortho. This is a 49-year-old nurse. I mean, this is, again, your, your risk factors aren't there. This turned out to be an aggressive amyloblastoma. So this is a non-cancerous benign tumor. But this patient had to have half her, half her jaw removed because you can't just cut out amyloblastomas. You have to resect it all the way down to the bone. Um, so this is not a cancer, but this is still a life-threatening disease. And that's really what we're looking for. We're not looking for just cancer. If you Google amyloblastoma, this is what it does for these patients. So these are the things that we're trying to find. 
we're not looking for this. If you can't see this, we have issues, right? This was a case from a general dental office that saw a lesion on a patient that said, you know what, this isn't getting any worse, let's just monitor this lesion. So they monitored this lesion for three years. So they finally got a new hygienist, and she said, I'm not, I'm not touching this patient's teeth. This was a squamous cell invasive. Um, the second reason I show this case is because know your patient's medical history. This patient had both of his parents, his, both of his parents die from oral cancer. So you have to know your patient's medical history. Ask the questions that seem to be obvious, but you know, in today's world, you have to ask them. Um, those are things that we have to know. So again, do your differential diagnosis. It doesn't take much to know that's not good. That's the, the other side of the tongue. So these are radical surgeries that, that are, have to be done as well um, for invasive. The last picture I'll show you is, this is a hygiene, a hygiene symposium we did, and we screened everybody after. And hygienist had a lesion in the back of her throat and kind of see a little bit of red ir ir irritation. And now you see a pretty distinct dark spot. And this was outside under a tailgate tent, so the picture will be a lot better inside. Hygienists, this is, this is my argument to who's worse, an engineer or a, clini or a clinician. Hygienist pulled it, well, it's me. I don't need to go see anybody. I'll just take a look every six months. For two years, nothing ever happened. She never went to see anybody. Finally, her colleague said, look, go see, go see an ENT, figure out what that is. So the ENT finally did a biopsy. She came back, and the ENT said, you know, Mary, which way do you sleep at night? And she said, well, I sleep on my left side. He said, good. Did you have acid reflux in GERD? And I just did the biopsy. It confirms that. If you continue to, to, to not change your diet, to change the way you sleep and to eat the way you're eating, you're probably going to cause your own cancer in the next 10 years. Acid reflux to the tissue is the same thing that happens to the teeth. It chronically erodes things, and guess what happens? Who knows? It's not good for the tissue. So this patient didn't have cancer, didn't have dysplasia, didn't have HPV, but they had an issue that you need to address. And those are the type of things that you're going to be able to see with, with fluorescence technology. So um, does that make sense? So it's a discovery device. It's not diagnostic. Anything dark isn't cancer. There's things that you're going to see that are completely off the radar. Um, and those are the things that we're looking for, early stage, early discoveries. So when you find a lesion, take clinical images, do your two-week follow-ups. All those things are essential, collecting more information. Charts, pictures, all those things you currently do. Again, our phone took all these images, so I'm sure you can as well. It's not that hard. Turn the flash off, zoom in. And then cytology testing is another way that you can collect more information. So I'll go over this quickly before uh, we don't have a crazy amount of time left, but second part of the, the fact oral health assessment is the cytology testing. So first step, screen every patient, fluorescence, have them back in two weeks. If that lesion's still there and you're not ready for a biopsy yet, cytology is a great test that you can do. If you think it's cancer, you're going to do a biopsy. So I want to make sure that's clear. If you think a a cytology test is, is the way to go when you think it's 99% sure cancer. You can do it, but we still rather do a biopsy. Cytology is when you're 50% sure, you know, I'm 85% sure that's lichen planus. Let's swab it real quick. Let's take a, take a swab that we have, send it in, and you'll get the di diagnosis results in a week. Does that make sense? So the product on the market that was on the market for a long time is very similar to the way the smears were in the cervical world. It's a conventional cytology or a smear cytology. Everybody knows it as a brush biopsy. A brush biopsy is not a biopsy. It's concerning that people think it's a biopsy at times because if a brush biopsy comes back positive, what do you do? You do an actual biopsy. So a brush biopsy, you would take a very hard wiry brush, you would penetrate to draw blood, which you don't need to do, but that's the way they wanted you to do it, and then you'd put it on a slide. You make the slide, there's always controversy. Now what happens is when you have a multi-layer of cells, the pathologist gets this. So a lot of the readings said atypia. Atypia just means I have no clue what it is, but I don't, I I don't want to say it's nothing. It's a CYA call in my mind. So if you have atypia, at that point, you would then do a biopsy. But here, you have clumps of cells, and that's why pap smears were a lot of times, back in the day, smears, you had to get three positive paps to be diagnosed cervical cancer. Why? Because they saw this, and then did this again, and then did this again, and by the third one, they're like, all right, I think I got a good idea. But now, they don't do smears in, in pap smears. We call it pap smear like I call my Kleenex that I buy from Costco Kleenex. I buy Kirkland's tissue paper. It's just, it's Kleenex, right? So pap smears are pap smears. Now they use liquid-based cytology in the cervical world. And that's what you have the ability to use. So site ID is a liquid-based cytology. You non-invasively swab the lesion. The swab is not going to draw blood. 
naturally your cells exfoliate. They slough off. And you have the ability to then collect those cells, put them in a vial, and this is what you get in the pathology world. That's a monolayer of cells because we make the cells in-house. We, we make the slides in-house. And when you have a monolayer of cells, guess what that does? Your accuracy is sky high. So now we're not even going to tell you if it's just cancer or not. We're going to tell you if, let me give you the examples. We're going to tell you cancer, yes or no. And then we're going to tell you if there's some sort of keratotic tissue. We're going to tell you if there's a bacteria issue. There's going to be a lot more information. There's some patients recently we had herpes. So you're able to diagnose a lot of things. But the one thing it does not do is tell you the depth of the lesion. So we have a lot of specialists that do a biopsy in cytology, right? So a biopsy tells you the depth of the lesion, and a, cy a cytology tells you what's going on cellularly. So combine the two, you kind of have a perfect world. A biopsy is going to be able to tell you how deep things are, and a cytology is going to tell you on a cellular level. So for us in the clinic, you're able to swab that lesion, send it in within a week. Hey, Rob, you know what? You have some potential malignant lesion. It's leukoplakia, or you know what? We have some dysplasia. Let's send you off, and let's take that next step. Or, hey, Rob, great news. We had a lesion... It came back as some inflammation. You probably, probably had some chronic issues. So maybe you want to look at your diet. Maybe you want to do this. So you're able to actually get a definitive diagnosis with a lot of information. Does that make sense? So it's not just cancer, yes or no. Um, and that's really where the cytology world has changed. There are cytology swabs in India that are used with a soft bristle toothbrush because in the, the incidence is so high. And you're now able to go in there and find the cancer before they even need to do a biopsy with a soft bristle toothbrush. That's how easy it is to exfoliate these cells out. Um, you can find that. You can do a lot of different things. So site ID is what you can do for that. There's a biopsy service, a nationwide biopsy service that we have as well. We try to make sure that it's all read by oral pathologists. That's why we make sure that they're all in-house by an oral pathologist, not a general pathologist. So if you have a question of a, a lichen planus lesion, a lot of times general pathologists may not be able to kind of give you the game plan for that. Um, we have HPV testing as well. We have a pH test on the market. It's a chair side pH test. So again, the reason I share all these is because there's a lot of different ways you can diagnose and find things with your patients that who knows what's really going to happen from it. If you have a pH that's six all day long, we have issues. We've got to get them back to neutral. You know, my wife has acid reflux and GERD, so I assure you, we grew up in New Orleans. We're an Italian family. We love spaghetti. Not the best idea to eat spaghetti for her, or if it is, not late in the afternoon because acid reflux acts up later in the afternoon before she sleeps, and you can test those things with pH tests. So, again, all the different ways they'll be able to do that. Um, remember, with HPV testing, it is a point-in-time test, so you're only going to know right now if that patient has HPV or not. So it's, it's not always the best test. We, don't always, we have the option for it. Uh, Oral DNA has the option for it. But know if a patient walks in your office and says, I want to do an HPV test, all that's telling you is today if they have HPV. That doesn't mean tomorrow they won't get it. So that's kind of the mental part of it. And with biomarker testing, biomarker testing has a ways to go in dentistry. There's going to be a ton more coming out. The one thing I'll warn you with biomarker testing is the fact that in breast cancer, the biomarker tests are pretty far advanced. Dr. Wong's stuff is phenomenal. And if you're diagnosed with this, this gene, that means you're 70, 80 percent likely to get breast cancer. It's still not 100 percent, but if you're more likely to get breast cancer, you have the option to do what? Angelina Jolie's famous. She removed both of her breasts. You have that option. In the dental cavity, I mean the oral cavity, the tests are nowhere near 70 percent, but say it's 100 percent. If I am 100 percent, I know that I'm going to get oral cancer. What do you do? You get screened every six months. You're not going to cut out their tongue if it happens on the other side. So there's an issue with, there's a big issue with genetic testing um, with oral cancer in the oral cavity because with that data, it's great to know, but it, you're still going to treat them in s the same way as you treat me. You're going to screen me every six months, or maybe it's every three months instead, but does that make sense? So the genetic testing aren't genetic tests in dental, it's just risk factor tests. In other parts of the body, it is a genetic test and biomarker test, but here it's just a risk factor test. Um, so that's kind of that part. I'll, I'll go over the business part a little bit because I'm sure everybody checked off the for-profit box. Um, there are dental insurance codes to do for fluorescent screening. I'll throw my favorite disclaimer out, disclaimer out there. It is dental insurance. Good luck. No, it's not, it's not that bad. Um, dental insurance doesn't cover it as much. It's 50% of the time we do see it covered, so it's better than 10 years ago. 
The one thing that I do not understand is the fact that why medical insurance doesn't cover this because medical insurance would save billions of dollars at finding it now, but medical insurance thinks it's dental's job and dental doesn't care because they're not losing money because they don't treat the patient if they get cancer. So um, I don't honestly ever foresee insurance covering this service. Why? I don't know. MD Anderson screens every patient under the sun for it. So we would love coverage to happen. That means more people would get screened. The way I like to present it and the way most of our offices present it is by saying, Rob, we're going to go ahead and screen you today. We're going to try your insurance. Realistically, it's probably not going to be covered because this is advanced technology. But you pay $20 copay for breast cancer screening for your mammogram or $20 for your pap smear. We're going to go ahead and charge you $20 for, for to do the screening. So once a year screening, non-invasive, it takes a few minutes. That's the way a lot of our offices do it. Um, if you don't want to charge, that's great. We have offices that don't charge. You can find it, kind of fit it however you want in your protocol. So our device has no consumables, so you don't have to charge, but at the same time, you're probably running a business, so you have to figure out how to recoup it at some point. Um, there is an ROI on it. We know that we'd like you to save a million lives and everybody's life that's out there, but we can help you implement it to increase revenue. I mean, $5 a patient goes a long way. If you educate your patients properly, they'll pay for this all day long. And look, I, I gave my dentist a device, and he charges me $65 a screening. <laughs> and he sits there and hands me a brochure and says, Rob, you just told me that 20 to 40-year-old white males are the highest risk factor. And I look at him like, you got to be kidding me. I was like, you really are not going to screen me? And he's like, no. And I, you know, in our office, we don't have a clinician, so I'm not going to pretend like we do. I said, all right, done. I'll do it. I don't know if it's, I mean, so I, I pay every year to get screened. He presents it properly. You know, he guilts the hell out of me to do it. But, um, but that's the option that you have is, is charging for it, not charging for it. Hand the brochure to your patient. Educate them on the risk factors. People don't expect stuff for free, but they don't expect you to hand them a consent form and say $65, yes or no. I'm checking no all day long. You hand them a bro brochure. Rob, this is something we do in our office. We'd love for you to do it, you know, we recommend it for everybody 17 years of age and older. Some of our offices have kids that they do it for free on, as long as the patients are paying for it, however you want to do it. But there is a way to add revenue to doing so. Um, with cytology, there is a code for it. So if you're doing the swab cytology, there is a code. It's 7287. The one thing I'll tell you is with the brush biopsy, people didn't want you to do it, specialists, because you would bill a biopsy, you'd make more money, but then they couldn't do an actual biopsy. So... That's why they call it a brush biopsy. I don't recommend billing a biopsy if you're not actually doing a biopsy because now when they get referred off for a specialist, insurance isn't going to cover that biopsy. This is not the same code. It's a different code. It is a swab cytology code. A lot of our offices are billing for it, 100 hours or so, from doing a simple, a simple swab. Put it in $20, $50, whatever it is. Some offices do it for free if they charge for the screenings. Again, there's programs that we can help you with and incorporate it, but it is a very non-invasive way to diagnose these patients. Um, and then marketing. The last thing I'll cover is marketing because I know I only have a few minutes. But um, a lot of times you hear these studies that say you know, only 20% of dentists do oral cancer screening, 5%, 30%. Those studies are phenomenally done by engineers. They do a great job of, you know, what do, you, what do I want you to say? And I'm going to do a subset of people. If I, if I surveyed every single person in Texas that was at a Texas Pride Fair, what do you think they would do? Say, I love Texas. So they surveyed people in, in Walmart that said, have you ever had an oral cancer screening? They said, no, I've never had it. You probably did it on them, you just never told them. So make sure your patients understand what you're doing. Market the hell out of it. You know, why come see us? We're doing oral cancer screenings here that you may or not have had before. Uh, we have some offices that do some great videos, great photography, show the videos up. If you do it for free, if you do it for a charge, whatever it is, Tell your patients what you're doing because they don't have a clue what you're doing. I mean, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a patient. I'm not a clinician. I didn't know what my dentist did until I got in this industry. And now he still doesn't tell me. I mean, he makes me pay for half of it because he tells me. But um, making sure that you market it. Educate your patients. We have an office that said whitening for life. You know, I don't, those days are kind of over, right? Here's what I do. I do oral cancer screening for life because we care. And I asked him, what does that mean? He goes, I don't know. It sounds good. If you're a patient of ours, we screen you for free. So he gets more referrals. It's a great marketing tool. So there's different things that you can do. For this office's 25-year anniversary, guess what they did? They gave everybody a free oral cancer screening. Put a big old banner and brochure out, in the hall, uh, out on, the, on the, the road, the highway in front of their office. 
So there's different ways to market what you do, and I'm not saying that market and don't do it. We want you to do it, but talk to your patients about it. They want to know what you're doing. Um, we have these awareness signs, and it's amazing that people want to post stuff on Facebook and things go viral. Like the ice bucket challenge is crazy how viral it went. Take a picture with a patient. We have like eight or nine signs that all pertain to oral cancer. Tag that patient. You want to see how many new patients you're going to get? Like, oh, your dentist does that? What is that? You will get more new patients, and it'll cost you zero dollars. So if you have a different office, we have a bunch of signs. So, so Kelly's over here at the, in the exhibit hall, um, and he's in the back as well. And Kelly's a male that's bald, so don't confuse Kelly as a female. Sorry. Um, if you go see him, check out some of the signs. I mean, you have an office that you have a patient that walks in that wants to hold up a sign that says 50 shades of oral cancer. Tell me you don't tag them on Facebook, and that won't go viral. So there's different things that we try to have fun with it. We know it's cancer. Um, but realistically, doing community events, things of that nature, is something that we want to help with. So um, my last slide that I'll have up here is, this is everybody's goal, I think, is to end cancer. And you always try to bring it back to what can you physically do to end cancer, play your part. So being a clinician, screening early stages, understanding technology that you can use. Our goal is the same as your goal. We don't see patients, but we love to hear these stories. This ticker is way out of date, but on the top right of our website, we have a live save ticker. We're not going to put up there what we think we saved a life. We're going to put up there a clinician like yourself said, Rob, I found this crazy picture. And you know what? This is a lesion we found. So we tick these up every time that we have a story that comes back to us. We'd love to hear those stories from you guys. Um, the last slide is on Facebook. We have a charity campaign. There are more than 60 people in this room. We're 60 likes away. So every 500 likes, we donate advice to a nonprofit. Those nonprofits take devices, they go to Belize to do screenings, they do Ronald McDonald charities, things of that nature. So it's a way for us to give back. So if everybody goes on our page, one thing is you'll keep educated. We're going to continue to give you information. And the second thing is we're able to donate devices because that's kind of the program we put together. So um, this is my information. We'll be here. Um, I appreciate everybody's time today. Hopefully it was beneficial, and, and thanks for having us. Is, are there any, any questions specifically, or I know everybody can ask after. I don't know how much time we have, but uh, ten, minutes. ten minutes? No, one, one, okay. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Sorry, we'll bring you the microphone. Oh, you got it. Thank you. Hi, we've been doing the Bellscope for a couple of years. When awesome. they did the initial training with it, they you had a unilateral lesion and you did the blanching, but you didn't really talk about that much. Is that still something? Blanching is something you can do. So his question was, you know, he uses the fluorescence technology, Velscope, you can go in there and blanch a lesion. Um, blanching works whether it's through fluorescence or not. You can still always do blanching. And what blanching is used to do is when you see a lesion that you're concerned about, you want to take a blunt object, blanch it, so you want to see the blood vessels come back. Um, I feel a lot of times people always, it's always 100% uh, not 100% sure. So the question is, you know, if it doesn't blanch, see them back in two weeks. And if it does blanch, see them back in two weeks. So I don't like to talk about blanching that much because if something's going on there, you're probably going to see. And if it is some sort of trauma, there's some reason there's trauma there. So if you blanch it and there's a bunch of blood coming back right away, you, it's, you know, in theory, it's the blood vessels trying to help that, that trauma lesion or whatever it is. And if blood vessels take a few extra minutes, then it may not be trauma. Maybe it something more severe. But we like to keep it simple. I don't want to have three lights. You know, I used to work at Tremira. We had a device with three lights. Um, we want you to look for dark versus light, have them back in two weeks, and not worry about did it blanch. I don't know. You think it did. And so we try not to go that route. But yes, you can, you can blanch with anything. You can blanch with, uh, with our device or anything. Yes, sir. Great question. I, I actually had the same question. But uh, and, uh, also, too, I did see in one of the uh, slides that you had that there was a lesion that you had that was in the midline, so oral cancer unilateral. And you had a picture of one in the midline. Yeah. It's kind of went across everything. It went against everything I just said, right? Um, that's the hard thing. I mean, it, if it's in the midline, and at that certain spot, they thought it was candid or candidiasis. They thought it was something, some inflammation, some bacterial infection. So there'll be some rare occasions that you can't do differentials, or maybe somebody has some sort of trauma on the right side and something else on the left. So understanding that side is, you know, you can't always do differentials. But the two-week follow-up should help out a lot. I mean, and, and look, there's a lot of lesions that... You may do a differential and say, look, you know what? It's on both sides. I still don't like it. Come back in two weeks. If that's still there, hopefully it's gone by that point. Or if it's still there and it's, if it's bilateral, then you know, 
it doesn't hurt to do a cytology or take the next step. If you don't have a clue, if you even have 1% of certain uncertainty, it doesn't hurt to say, you know what? I'd feel better if we knew 100% of the time. Let's find out what this is. Yes, sir. Um, the, the phone is a great... Uh, the phone is a great uh, uh, improvement of uh, areas where you can see mm -hmm. and where the light can shine directly. What about the pharyngeal spaces? What about the uh, roots of the tongue and the other more difficult yeah, so this, reach so, areas? So the question is with the oral pharynx. Oral pharynx is where we're seeing a lot of HPV lesions now. <laughs> if you can't see it with your loops, with your light, with your eyes, you can't see it with this device. So that's why we always talk about stressing the palpations, making sure that you do that. The oral pharynx is one of the hardest places right now because there's things back there that you can't see. And look, I've tried to pull my tongue out as far as I can, and I, you, know, you just can't see back there. So there's, you always have to go in knowing that in the oral pharynx lesion, this light won't help, loops won't help. You know, if you can't physically see with your own eyes or loops, there's things out there that are people are trying to develop, but it's hard because you can't see it. So that's why we always stress the palpation. If something happens in the oral pharynx, it's going to go south first. We want to catch it when it's here as opposed to somewhere else. So that's always a concern in the oral pharynx. And that's the biggest concern with ENTs right now is, you have to do a laryngoscopy. And, you know, my wife had some acid reflux in her throat one time. Being in this world, what do you do? You, I called MD Anderson to one of the clinicians we work with and said, I don't care if nothing's going on down there, but I'm not on my dime. I'm not having like a story of, you know, here's this guy that lectures about oral cancer and his wife has oral cancer. So we did a laryngoscopy and that's the only way to look back there. Um, so if anybody's ever concerned, an ENT, but to your point, you don't go to an ENT to do a laryngoscopy every year. So that's the hard part. If, if you ever hear raspy a voice, people a lot of times when you do a screening, have them sit straight and if they favor one side, have them talk normally, have them stick their tongue out. If they stick their tongue out and it's, you know, kind of cockeyed, you know, that's a concern. But there's always been a concern with the oral pharynx. It's a hard, that's a hard one. Thank you all. Thank you all again. If you all have any questions, we'll be here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.